Hi, good afternoon and welcome to another HUD PIH RIP EIV training session. My name is Nicole Faison. I'll be your trainer for this afternoon. And I want to welcome all of our PHAs that have come from all across the country to learn new and exciting things about HUD's EIV system as well as the mandated use of the EIV system. What I'd like to do, which I normally don't do, we have some special guests here with us this afternoon. And I'd like to take an opportunity to introduce those individuals and they're going to come up and share a few words with you today. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Public Housing and Voucher Programs, Milan Ozdenik. Thank you, Nicole, and uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone to HUD. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Public Housing. Uh, and um, uh, I can hardly say enough about uh, this particular selection. Um, Ms. Enriquez, uh, for 13 years, was the director of the Boston Housing Authority um, and uh, one of the na nation's largest housing authorities. At the BHA, she was responsible for an 850-person workforce, $280 million budget, uh, overseeing almost 12,000 public housing units and 13,000 housing vouchers, almost 10% of Boston's populations. She is one of us. Uh, under Ms. Enriquez's guidance, uh, BHA is uh, really one of the leaders uh, among housing authorities and, and redevelopment authorities recreating new public housing out of old and, and creating those into thriving mixed income communities using HUD's HOPE 6 and other development uh, opportunities that came about. She created housing strategies and programs to help homeless and introduced green principles into BHA's business practices and building maintenance and construction. I think more than anything though, Ms. Henriquez um, uh, cares about residents and understands our business. And uh, for that, we are all grateful to the secretary and the president for nominating her. She was uh, unanimously conf confirmed by the Senate on May 21st, 2009. And since then, she's been ratified by every person she comes in touch with here in the Office of Public Housing. Uh, so it's with great pleasure, allow me to introduce the Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing, Sandra Enriquez. Good afternoon. Um, I sit there, it's always sort of hard to listen to someone read your uh, bio. <clears throat> I said to Milan, just say the first sentence and the last sentence and that's it. Um, but thank you, Milan, and thank you to Nicole. Um, I think that uh, I, from what I've heard of briefings and, and, and training sessions Nicole has done before, you're going to get a lot out of this. There'll be a lot of give and take, and um, I hope that you find it enjoyable as well as informative. Um, I want to just spend a few minutes sort of setting the context and the tone for the training this afternoon. Um, when HUD, as you know, makes payments to public housing agencies um, to assist individual and family program beneficiaries, it must make every effort to confirm that the right recipient is receiving the right payment for the right reason at the right time. Um, and to reduce improper payments, waste, fraud, and abuse in public um, housing rental assistance programs, you understand that the Enterprise Income Verification, or EIV, system was created. And I want to just digress for a moment and tell you that um, in the past several months, the White House has uh, put together and, and uh, ordered that um, a number of agencies in the federal government participate in an improper payments committee of which HUD is a part. Um, and it really continues to, to stress the importance of making sure that the right payments to the right people at the right time for the right reasons happens so that we can ensure that our programs are reaching as many people um, as who need those services. Um, initially, EIV was created to address a billion dollar subsidy payment error um, that was attributed to tenant underreporting of income and so that um, public and Indian housing rental assistance programs could serve and provide access to as many eligible families as possible within our appropriated budget. Since the inception deployment at EIV in 2006, um, we have expanded EIV to assist housing authorities in identifying potential subsidy payment errors associated with various administrative errors, changes in family composition, duplicate rental assistance program uh, payments, 
in both public and Indian housing as well as in the multifamily rental assistance programs. In 2007, EIB received a Presidential Management Excellence Award and was the major contributing factor for the uh, General Accounting Office removing HUD from the high risk list after resigning on that list for 13 long years. HUD also received numerous awards from private and public entities for the successful deployment and development of a technological solution to solve a multi-billion subsidy payment error. Now to demonstrate our, our commitment and our steadfast focus on accountability for reducing improper payments among HUD staff, and we've coordinated with PHAs and industry stakeholders taking action on identifying and eliminating improper payments, we initiated rulemaking um, to mandate the use of EIV and the system um, and all the pieces that go with it. The refinement of income and rent determination requirements in public and assisted housing programs was published in this, on December 29th last year. This rule will assist PHAs with ensuring that limited federal dollars serve as many eligible families as possible and hold both uh, PHAs, residents, and HUD accountable for our respective parts in determining the level of assistance for a family. Ultimately, the successful implementation of this rule will protect access to PIH rental assistance programs by their intended beneficiaries. Today's training will assist you with successful implementation of the refinement rule and demonstrate how PHAs can reduce administrative burden in conducting re-examination of family income while improving the integrity of this process and this program. We are committed with you to providing ongoing training and technical assistance to assist you with effective and efficient administration of public housing and voucher programs. And I hope today that you will find today's training both beneficial and we encourage you to share with us all of your feedback, your ideas and your suggestions so we can continue to both make this uh, uh, program um, operate in the best possible way to ensure that we continue to decrease improper payments but bottom line, first and foremost, is to ensure that we are helping as many eligible households across this nation um, with the programs um, that will help them succeed um, and get on with stable housing, which builds the foundation of all of our lives. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of this training. Nicole? Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Henriquez. And so, Let's go ahead and get on with our agenda. Now, I do have uh, a couple announcements that I, I want to share with you before I get into the nuts and bolts of this training session. Uh, for those of you that are here in our live studio audience, uh, you will receive a certificate of completion for this training session at the conclusion of the training. For those of you that are uh, watching this via webcast later today, the uh, request form for the certificate. It's already generated and this will be emailed to uh, those that are subscribed to the PIH RIP mailing list uh, today. Remember you guys have been telling you get on the list, get on the list so you can get everything expeditiously, automatically. Uh, the goal here is to make sure that whenever HUD releases information that you get it expeditiously so you don't have to try and figure out where it is on the HUD website because HUD manages a lot of programs. So our website is huge. So if you're on the PIH RIP mailing list, anytime we issue guidance such as PIH notices, anytime we have training scheduled, anything that we think will help you, you will automatically receive it. Um, one of the handouts uh, in today's session is the uh, PIH uh, EIV resource page and there is a link that will direct you to subscribing to the mailing list. Uh, of course, those of you that e send an email message into the PIH RIP mailing uh, mailbox, at the end of every email message that goes out of that mailbox, there's a little line that tells you what to do to subscribe to the mailing list. So we want to make sure that you're able to receive the information automatically. Subscribing to the mailing list takes about maybe 10 or 20 seconds, okay? Um, secondly, um, thank you so much for your feedback on the uh, PHA's debts owed to uh, debts owed to PHA's and termination brochure. Um, you all were very quick to provide me with uh, feedback on that document. 
and I have all of the comments. I think probably we received about 500 uh, comments in response to the draft one pager brochure that I sent out um, earlier, I think it was last week. And so I hope to have that finalized by tonight to get that out to you. Um, that brochure or pamphlet or whatever you want to call it, it's a document to inform tenants and applicants about EIV and how it will impact them. Um, it's not a mandatory document, but I created that document for you because you said you wanted something uniform and consistent that you could give to everybody. Um, and so I hope to have that document finalized for you tonight, if not tonight, tomorrow. And if you're on the PIH RIP mailing list, you will automatically receive it. So can you get excited about that? <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and get into our agenda. And I apologize to those out there viewing that we got started a little late, so I apologize for that. And we're having, tech, oh, here we go, technical difficulties. So today's training is going to focus on the Rental Housing Integrity Improvement Project Overview. We're going to go over the final rule. Uh, we're also going to have a specific questions and answers session about the rule, OK? And then we're going to get into the second component of the training, which is going to focus on effective use of the EIV system and we're focusing on use of the income report, the income discrepancy resolution process based on housing authorities finding out that there's some income that may not have been reported by the family. So we're going to go through an income discrepancy resolution process. Then we're also going to focus on the deceased tenants report as well as the new debts owed to PHAs and termination module and we will have a question and answer session at the end of that component and then we will open it up again for a general Q&A session regarding the material that's being provided to you today. And throughout the training session, our technical staff will be uh, displaying for you the telephone number to call and that number is only to be called today, January 28th. So please don't call tomorrow to ask your question. If you have a question, Tomorrow, if you go home tonight and you think of that question, you need to send that uh, question to PIH, period, RIP, period, TA at HUD.gov. Also, same thing with the HUD TV uh, at HUD.gov email address. Please, after today, do not send any email messages to that web, web account because that will not be answered. So questions after January 28th, send them to PIH period rip.ta at hud.gov and that is listed in your um, PIH EIV resource uh, document. So let's talk briefly and we're going to talk real briefly because the Assistant Secretary went over the overall uh, purpose of our Rental Housing Integrity Improvement Project which is basically a secretarial as well as a presidential initiative designed to ensure that limited dollars serve as many families as possible and we want to make sure that everybody's getting the services that they need within the appropriate uh, dollars. Now as Assistant Secretary mentioned, there is a presidential executive order and you'll notice that on the PowerPoint presentation I referenced the executive order which is committed to uh, both not only the federal government but the state and local entities that are administering federal dollars to collaborate and work together to ensure that those limited dollars serve as many families as possible. And the goal here is to eliminate fraud, waste, and abuse in the HUD programs. And this is, uh, as you listen to our new president and that administration, they are very big on transparency and they want everybody to know what's going on. Okay, and just I want to clarify about transparency because one of the things that uh, OMB is working on with the Department of Treasury is creating a uh, uniform website where for every federal agency that is receiving federal dollars they're going to be listing those entities who have received dollars in error, who have wasted dollars, who have committed fraud. And so it's basically letting everybody know who did what. So uh, one of the things we do in our PHA communities, we know that we have families that are in need of our services. Unfortunately, there's about 
of your housing portfolio that is not so forthcoming with their information. So those 25 people out of 100 are taking up a unit and taking up federal subsidy that should not be going to them and could be going to your mother, your grandmother, your sister who's in need of housing. And so it is our job together to work to ensure that those dollars get into the right hands and those families get into that housing that they so desperately need. And of course, our objectives, again, ensuring the correct amount of assistance is provided to eligible families. And we want to emphasize, and did you, if you listen to Assistant Secretary Henriquez, these programs are designed for the intended beneficiaries who are eligible. Eligible means that you are eligible to re receive those benefits. And some families, they feel that they are entitled Entitled and eligibility are two totally different arenas. And so we as housing providers have to educate our public, our tenant, our community so that they understand the requirements of the program. And some people do not want to uh, go along with the requirements of the program. If that is the case, our HUD rental assistance programs are not for you. Okay, and so you as housing providers need to convey that same message. There are rules, there are requirements those rules and requirements are in place to ensure that the right families get the right amount of benefits, okay? So let me get into the overview of the rule. And this is going to focus on, again, the major components of the rule. And, you know, the overall purpose of the refinement rule was to implement the EIV system. Many of you have already been using the EIV system for many, many, many years to ensure that Again, limited dollars serve as many eligible families as possible. HUD uh, has, you know, basically come up with this final rule. We've worked with the industry uh, to come up with something that's reasonable and sensible that will help us achieve our objectives. And so the goal here is to reduce administrative and subsidy payment errors. One of the biggest uh, things that I love about this rule is that it's going to help to eliminate quite a bit of administrative burdens in the in income verification process. And we've all been down that road, and you all know I'm a former Housing Authority staff person, and so we know what is going on. And so as a HUD official, it's my goal to help you to reduce that administrative burden. And so today I'm going to explain to you how to do that. Uh, we have guidance that's going to be coming out uh, within the next two to three weeks. We already uh, released one guidance already, which we're going to talk about. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody understands that. So that's why we're having this training. And, of course, the PIH RIP mailbox is designed to answer any questions that you may have as you're going to implement this rule. If you have a bump in the road, you have a resource, you have a lifeline to reach out so that we can assist you. Okay, so let's focus on the changes. Uh, basically, the new rule is going to revise the existing regulatory requirement at 24 CFR uh, section 908, which is the electronic transmission of required family data. In plain layman's terms, my friends, that's the HUD form 50058. You guys sending the 58 into PIC, and so I'm going to go over what changes have been modified to that particular regulation. The second revision impacts 24 CFR Part 5, Section 216, which focuses on the disclosure and verification of Social Security numbers. Now, this regulation has been on the books for many, many, many years. It's been tweaked, and I'm going to explain to you what the tweaks are and, uh, you know, how to implement that. Uh, the other changes are revisions to 24 CFR Part 5, Section 218, which focuses on the penalties for a failure to disclose the Social Security number. Again, this is an existing HUD regulation that's been on the books for many, many years. It's been tweaked, and I'm going to explain to you what the tweaks are. Last, new regulation, not in the regulation book ever, ever, ever. 24 CFR Part 5, Section 233 is the requirement that housing authorities utilize the EIV system. Now. This rule has a very long history, and I'm not going to go through all this, but basically this is a rule that has been 
uh, in the works for the last five years. And as you uh, want to in your leisure, you can look at the history. As uh, we mentioned earlier, this rule was published on December 29, 2009. The final rule takes effect on Sunday. Now, I think other than a couple people, uh, most people don't work on Sundays. So the rule really, uh, it's effective January 31st, 2010. So when you come in to work on Monday, this coming Monday, know that there's a new set of rules and you have to put them in place. You cannot wait to modify your ACOP, your admin plans. Most people have already been preparing for this change to the rule and many of you have already done the changes that you need, but you need to be aware that come on Monday, you will have to implement the provisions of the rule. Okay, so this leads right into what should housing authorities be doing in preparation for implementing this rule. We encourage you to A, notify your tenants, notify your applicants. One, that's one of the benefits of this EIV, uh, what you should know about EIV brochure. Um, and actually it's not gonna, we're gonna make it so that it's not a brochure because you wanna be able to keep it in the tenant file folder. So we are, uh, it's still gonna be a one-sided document. And again, this is not a mandatory, it's gonna be a one-sided piece of paper that basically is going to outline what is EIV, what information is in EIV and where does it come from. It's also going to explain what EIV information is used for. Uh, most questions that come into Washington, D.C., because I already know you guys are doing your J-O-B because I get the calls all the time. I didn't authorize my housing authority to um, get my income information for the last five years. So did you sign a HUD consent form or consent form created by your housing authority? Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Well, that authorizes them to obtain information about you for the purposes of determining eligibility and level of assistance. So we do have a little bullet in here that talks about, is my consent required in order uh, for information to be obtained about them? Because a lot of times they, they feel that you have gotten this information uh, unfairly. So uh, we want to let them know that they have to sign that consent form. No, no, I take that back. They do not have to sign the consent form. Now, you all know 24 CFR Part 5, Section 230 says that the tenant and applicant must sign at least one or more consent forms for the purposes of determining eligibility and level of assistance. If you opt not to sign it, I can't determine your eligibility. So please, my friends, just it's all about decisions. And people have a right to make that decision, but you as housing providers, you have to uphold what the regulation says. And that regulation says that if I can't get A, B, C, and D, I can't determine your eligibility. And if I can't determine your eligibility, then I, I, there's nothing I can do to assist you, okay? So my friends, what do you have to do? My favorite acronym, Kim, keep it moving. Okay, you got long waiting lists, so you don't have time to be sitting around arguing with people as to what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. You're just going to say, hey, okay, look, I, I got to do my job here. They've given me this EIV system, and it is so RAB, R-A-B, reducing administrative burdens. Okay, so when you go back, you're like, yeah, that's RAB. All right, then we tell them what their responsibilities are. Families need to understand, you have a responsibility to do something as housing program providers. The family has something to do as a potential recipient or recipient, and so we outline what those responsibilities are. And basically, it's being truthful, forthcoming, reporting complete and accurate income and household composition. Now, I, I love you guys because... You know, um, I was in trouble last night because I was working until about 11.30. And, you know, I always get a little chuckle because some of y'all sent some very um, uh, animated comments. So somebody sent me an email and said, Nicole, can you put on there, they must report their boyfriend and the girlfriend living in the unit? <laughs> we, we can put that in there, but we're going to clean it up a little bit, you know, so... <laughs> 
you know, yes, you must immediately notify your housing authority if you're going to have Sally and Bubba come live with you. And you have to, you ha yeah, you know I love Bubba. <laughs> you have to have PHA approval before they move in because otherwise they're a visitor. What's it, two weeks? Anything over two weeks, you know, that's establishing residency. Don't y'all watch Judge Judy to give, give you give them a key? They got occupancy rights. So, so anyway, we go over what are their responsibilities. Penalties, penalties for providing false information. This, this is not intended to intimidate people, but to educate, okay? The only ones who are intimidated are the ones that are See, y'all said it for me. The ones trying to get over. You should be intimidated because if you cheat, you're going to jail. If you cheat, you could be fined. If you cheat, you could be evicted or you could be, I, and I see I love the Section 8 program because y'all know what I tell you, right? You don't have to comply with any of these requirements. Not a problem. Half is cut and you figure out how you're going to pay the rent next month, right? Okay, so this is an informative brochure and again, we want to be able to say, and many of you are going to end up in court. I'm going to tell you this right now. If you haven't already, you're going to end up in court because Sally is going to owe you $15,000 in unpaid rent or overpaid HAP, okay? And what you want to be able to do is go into the court and say, Your Honor, it is our housing authority standard practice to notify all applicants and tenants about this EIV system thingy because that's... They can't get it right. It's like EIV. It's like that VI system, VIE, or whatever that thing is. They got me. We want to let them know that they have been informed, okay? They have been informed. I've, I've, and one of the things, you know, folks said, why is there a signature line on here? Signature is just to acknowledge that they've received a copy of this document. Now, of course, many people will say, I didn't know. I didn't understand what I was signing, okay? That's why I had a little clause on here saying that, you know, if you don't understand what was conveyed to you, you have, you have the right to consult with legal representation. We're not trying to say, hey, you know, send all your tenants to, uh, you know, legal representation. But when you're in court, you are the bad guys always. I know. I've been there. Okay? And I want to be able to say to the judge, your honor, we inform our families. Okay? We encourage them, you know, we sit and explain this or we, you know, have little workshops. A lot of you housing authorities, you guys have little workshops that the families, the applicants, when they're coming in, they have to go through and sit through the workshop and acknowledge that they understand what has been conveyed to them. And I try to put this in plain layman's term. Some of you all criticized uh, because you said, well, hey, you know, this thing is written on a seventh grade education level. Well. We don't. We have a general sense of the overall, demo, uh, you know, demographics of the families that we're serving. We don't want to write anything that's so way up here that the average everyday person doesn't understand what's being conveyed to them. So that's, you know, that's the purpose here. So, you know, in preparation for implementing the the EIV system in this rule, you want to notify your applicants, notify your tenant, have a meeting with your resident council. Have a meeting with, with your RAB. Go meet with your legal aid folks. If you have a legal aid office or if you have a, a legal, legal counsel that assists families that are in the uh, you know, low-income uh, designation, you want to reach out to them so that everybody has a clear understanding of what the rules are and what the expectations are. Now, you too, my friends, PHAs, you have a job to do too. Now, some of you, not all of you, but there's some of you that just maybe it's time for you to retire because you don't want to help people, okay? <laughs> because we get the calls here in Washington that they went in to report this change and, you know, Miss Smith hasn't called me back and I had, they got one lady, she faxed over her little phone log. I'm like, okay, well, you know, just, just be, you know, cognizant. We're a service provider, okay? And these people need your assistance. These are our families. We need to help them, okay? So in implementing this, um, this training is a mandatory training if you have access to the EIV system or if you are someone who does not have access to the system but you're going to access EIV information electronically or view printed information, 
the staff needs to watch this training session. It is a requirement, okay? So your staff should subscribe to the PIH RIP mailing list because I can tell you right now there's two PIH notices that are going to be coming out within the next three weeks. We want to make sure that you get that guidance because that is going to walk you through effective implementation of the EIV system. Now, questions regarding the final rule. Uh, you have a copy in your handout. Um, the electronic code of federal regulations uh, today is Thursday. Should have been updated last night or sometime yesterday with the new regulatory uh, language for the regulations. However, uh, I haven't confirmed it, but the bottom line is uh, I will confirm it and I will send you a link, a, a link to the Code of Federal Regulations so that you have access to that information because this Social Security number piece is a real touchy one and we're getting ready to get into that. But should you have questions about this rule, I am your point of contact. As the author of the rule for the Office of Public and Indian Housing, I'm your point of contact. Your local HUD field office they're learning this information just as you are through the training sessions and through uh, conference calls that we're having with our field offices. So feel free to uh, email the PIH RIP mailbox if you have a question. Uh, most of you will find that I typically respond uh, within a 24-hour period. So um, except for the week of May 22nd through the 29th, don't, I, I'm, I'm going to be in Aruba on vacation. and I don't do um, email in Aruba. So. That's the only week out of the whole year that I don't do HUD work, okay? So just letting you know, May 22nd, 29th, so if you say, I didn't get a response, I'm on the beach. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the revised regulation, 908-101. Again, this is about transmitting your 50058 form. Okay, this rule simply clarifies that housing authorities are required to transmit the 58. Duh, HUD spelled backwards. You've been doing it all along. All, all we're doing here is telling you, including moving to work housing authorities, you have to keep the 58 in the file folder. Everybody know, know that, right? See how simple that is? Now, here's a little, I, I want to show you the tweak. Look at the last bullet here. You have to maintain the 5 8 and the supporting documentation during the term of each assistant lease and for at least three years thereafter. Okay, so basically what that means is, in particular, like on a Section 8 program, it's very simple. When you execute that HAP contract and you have a lease associated with that HAP contract, you're keeping that for a period of three years. Okay, very simple. If they leave the program at EOP and the participation, you're maintaining that documentation, the 5-8 and the supporting documentation for three years from the EOP date. See how simple that is? Now, some of you are getting into going green and technological solutions to files. The beauty that I love about this rule is that we put a statement in there that electronic retention of the form 50058 and the supporting documentation is uh, acceptable in electronic format. The bottom line is, my friends, is that you have to be able to produce the documents when HUD comes to do an audit, or what, you know, whether it's HUD you know, program office, HUD field office, HUD OIG, or if you have, you know, you hire uh, independent third party uh, auditors to come and you know, make sure that you all are doing what you need to do locally, you need to make sure that those documents are accessible so that they can be audited, okay? Um, the question that always comes up about record retention is, well, my housing authority says we have to keep the records for seven years. That is your own PHA established record retention policy, okay? The uh, HUD record retention requirement is three years. So basically, you're, anything over three years, that's, that's really on you, okay? So that's your, your discretion as to how long you're going to keep those documents. Now, some of y'all might want to revisit your record retention policies because, not going to say any names where I was, but uh, the file folder was like one of 12. <laughs> and I'm like, well, gee, she only been in the program for three years. Oh, gee, Christmas. Okay, the next one. This is the stickler. Now, here's where you're probably going to be making a lot of notes. Disclosure and verification of Social Security numbers. 
All applicants and participants are required to disclose their social security number. Remember the regulation at 24 CFR Part 5, Section 216 used to say if they, if they were six, they didn't have to disclose, okay? If they were under six, that exemption no longer exists. If you're zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, you have to disclose your social security number. So those under six are no longer exempt. So this applies to your applicants and your participants. Now I do want to clearly go over this part here, the exemptions. Those individuals who are not required to disclose a social security number, and it's very few, okay? The first one deals with individuals who do not contend to have eligible immigration status. Now I know every time I say that phrase, contend to have eligible immigration status, they're like, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> what that means is that there are individuals who are non-citizens. They are not electing to say, yes, I have eligible immigration status, or no, I don't. Eligible immigration status means that you have permanent residency here in the United States. That means you got a green card, you are an asylee, or you're a refugee, or you're other individuals that uh, may fall into categories that Homeland Security has offered certain protections to individuals. We do have uh, guidance coming out, and if you all remember from the September 24th training session, I gave you those little cheat sheets from the Department of Homeland Security with respect to the um, acceptable documentation for establishing citizenship status and lawful permanent residency. So we do have a notice going out. The next group of people who are not required to disclose the Social Security numbers if they don't have it. You have some senior citizens or individuals that are 62 and over and I know some of you all had that lady that was born in 1897. <laughs> she most likely doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have the documentation. However, if she's receiving Social Security benefits or Medicare or any other type of state uh, or local uh, government provided benefit, I assure you she has a social. She might not be able to remember it. You just say, hey, look here, Miss Flossie. Um, let me help you get that Social Security number for us, okay? <clears throat> So, however, there's going to be this small, very small group. And the last time I checked the numbers, I think we had maybe 400 and, uh, 400, 400, 450 elderly nationwide who had not disclosed the Social Security number. Now, I didn't call them up to find out what the deal was, but most likely these individuals just don't have it to disclose. And so I want to applaud you all because from the time that the, the, uh, Final rule was introduced last January of 2009 up until now. You all tremendously reduced the number of individuals who hadn't reported a Social Security number. So you all to be commended for your efforts. So for the most part, we have collected Social Security numbers for 98% of the families and individuals that are in our program. So give yourselves a hand. I am so proud of you guys. I am. You're going to get a Cadillac for that. <laughs> All right now. So the next criteria of people who are exempt from the Social Security number disclosure are your tenants who have already disclosed the social and it's been determined to be valid. Now, it's, it's a couple of you sticklers out there. And I understand why you do it because, you know, people stealing people's identities all the time. And, you know, sometimes you know, Mary changes her hairstyle or her, you know, hair color, and she comes in and she said, you know me, I'm Mary Smith. Uh-uh, I don't know you. Driver's license, social security card, and birth certificate, please. <laughs> so you're trying to, you know, do the rundown again. But for those individuals who have previously disclosed a social, and it's valid, and I'm going to show you in EIV how you can see that the social is valid, you don't need to waste your time re-verifying socials that we already know that's valid. That's a waste of time, because remember, our goal is to be RAV, right? Reduce an administrative burden, okay? So this is the clarification provided under this rule. Now, what is the required documentation? You guys already got this down pat. It's simply a social security card, okay? 
However, if they don't have the Social Security card, the new tweaking of the regulation says the individual can provide you with a state or local government document, i.e., like people who receive food stamps. They have a benefit case history with food stamps or the Social Security benefit award letter or say uh, maybe they're receiving some type of educational assistance and they have a document that's originating from a state or gov uh, state or uh, state or federal uh, other federal government entity like the IRS. So if they have something from a state uh, state government entity or federal government entity, and as long as that document contains the individual's name and address and other information that you can ascertain that that social belongs to that individual, you may accept that as an alternative to the actual Social Security card. Um, has anybody had a chance to read the new PIH notice, excluding John and Jim? Okay, so did, did you all see um, in there, one of the things that HUD is recommending is that to ensure that we're protecting the identity of our families, we want to try and minimize displaying documents that carry the full Social Security number in tenant files. Okay, so HUD has made a recommendation in PIH Notice 2010-3 that housing authorities consider removing that photocopy of the Social Security card out of the file once EIV has confirmed that the Social Security number is valid. And again, it's a recommendation. It's not mandated. We're simply making that recommendation to you, okay? Now, the streamlined verification of Social Security numbers, as I mentioned, you will not have to re-verify your family's Social Security numbers if they're valid. You're now allowed to rely on documentation outside of the Social Security number. Again, that's going to free up some of your time, you know, relying on other documents that the family may already be providing to you that would contain that Social Security number. Now, this is a new regulatory provision. Addition of new household members who are under the age of six and they do not have an assigned Social Security number. Typically what you've done in the past, Mary comes in to add baby Jane to the lease and you put a little note in the file pending Social Security number. You use the PIC Alt ID generator and you generate that Alt ID. You're still going to do that. However, there's a caveat this go around. Now when they tell you, okay, I don't have the Social Security card yet, not a problem, you're going to add them to the lease. They're still el eligible to receive the benefits as if they had disclosed the Social Security number. But you have to let Mary know that she's got to bring you that evidence within 90 days. Because we all know when we do in our annual re-examination, you put the little yellow sticky on there, pen and social security, you put it to the side, and then, oopsies, I forgot about it. Eight months later, just so you know, audience out there watching, the people are pointing at one another. They're like, girl, you know you do that. <laughs> it's not uncommon. Okay, it happens. We got heavy caseloads. But now what has to happen is that the family has to be advised. They have 90 days to deliver to you that evidence of the Social Security number, okay? However, do keep in mind some things may prevent that individual from getting that documentation within 90 days. You know, things happen. You know, mom got sick, was in the hospital, my father died, and I just really didn't have... These are circumstances beyond the control of the individual. Now, my friends, you all know your clients, so if you hear that same story, you're like, wait a minute, your mom and I died about seven times now. <laughs> okay? Then you need to be like, wait a minute, hold up. Okay, wait, that's another excuse. Then, then you have to go on to the, to the other side of the fence and say, wait a minute, we have a problem here. But the bottom line is that when there's scenarios where there's circumstances beyond the individual's control, you know, we're very understanding, compassionate individuals. And so we know that they're... They're not just deliberately trying to not disclose, but there are circumstances that prevented them from making that disclosure within the 90 days. And so you are authorized to grant another 90-day extension to get the information. 
Okay, so basically that's 180 days or six months. Okay, now if the person can't get a Social Security card in six months, you might have to go, hmm, is that really your baby? <laughs> okay, you might have to start asking some questions. But like I said, for the most part, everybody is disclosing their Social Security numbers. It's really not an issue. The second component is on the flip side. If you're requesting, if the family is requesting to add an additional household member who is over the age of six, they don't get the same luxury as those who are under six with the 90-day uh, grace period. These individuals coming to you, if they say, hey, uh, you know, my niece is uh, going to come live with me and I don't have her social security number and all that, I'm, I, I can help you, but when you provide me with the social security number, you cannot add anyone who's over the age of six to the family composition until they disclose that SSN. You cannot generate an alternate ID. They have to provide the documentation upon the request of adding that family member or uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, foster child to the family composition. So that is a change that you need to alert your families to that if they're requesting to add people to the family composition, they must come to the table with documentation, okay? Because until then, you cannot add them to the, to the family composition. So that's pretty much straightforward, okay? So most of you, and I, I'll be the first one to tell you, I, I was guilty, and this is, bef look, you see this rule is coming out in, in 2010, right? So 2002, 2001, when I was at the Housing Authority, when Sally came to the office, said, yeah, I want to add my stuff. Uh-uh, honey. Birth certificate, Social Security card. When you got it, come back and see me. But my baby was born just last week. I'm okay. TBSSSS, right? Y'all know what, I'm not going to tell you what that stands for, but some of y'all know what that, that's what I'd be thinking in my head, but you know, you would never say that. But anyway, you are like, yeah, honey, when you come back with the documents, we'll, we'll get your paperwork all in order. So see, see the disparity between what it is now. So under six, they had the grace period to go on and add. You can add them to the family composition now and give them 90 to 180 days to go on and get that document. Over six, uh-uh. Documentation before adding. Okay, very straightforward. Uh, let's see. The other piece that's in this regulation wasn't in the existing now allows you the flexibility to determine when the family member has to disclose to you a newly assigned Social Security number. Now, it's not likely to happen, but there are some individuals, and like I said, it would be like .0000009 likelihood that somebody would be assigned a new Social Security number. But in the event that an individual is assigned a new social security numbers. Your applicants and tenants need to be aware of the fact that when they're issued a new, a newly assigned SSN, they have to disclose it within a time frame that you establish. Okay, so it could be at the time of the receipt or within 30 days of you know the issuance of the new SSN, the next interim re-exam or the next annual re-exam. You get to specify when that is. So if you're if you guys are starting to look at your ACOP and your admin plan and you have, a, uh, you have your standardized policies with respect for Social Security number disclosure, you may want to go ahead and set that perimeter as to when folks are going to be required to disclose that newly assigned SSN. Okay, rejection of documentation. Now, the HUD regulations has always basically had a little note there that says that you can reject documentation. So one of the things that I want to specify here is that this new regulation uh, component says that PHAs cannot reject an applicant's or tenant's documentation uh, unless it's in accordance with HUD specified uh, guidelines or policy or guidelines. So here are the reasons to ex that you can reject documentation, okay? The document is not an original. You cannot accept a Social Security card that's photocopied. Now, I, 
I, there's some people out there, you know, they think you know how to make that seven look like a nine and, <laughs> you know, so you have to deal with original documents only. And so if they come and say, here, here's this photocopy, we're doing just like uh, Social Security Administration and vital records, original documents only. This is nothing new to the general public. The notion here is that federal, federal agencies need to streamline their, their policies and procedures for these documentation. So HUD is aligning its verification procedures in accordance with other uh, established federal agencies. So no, no uh, copies of documents. Now here's my favorite one. If the original document has been altered, mutilated, or not legible. Some of you all have some tenants that come in, or applicants, they come with these papers and it's ripped up, tore up, taped back together, the tape's so old that it's turned gold and it was once transparent. <laughs> Sally, thank you so much for bringing in this information. However, I'll need something that's a little more untattered, okay? No, this is my favorite one. If the document appears to be forged, now, in plain layman's terms, you watch Judge Judy. This is a fake. If it doesn't look right and you get that little inkling at the back of your neck, and you know, the fonts look a little off and it's kind of smudged, or you know, the signature. And some of you all folks, I swear, you all are not housing authority staff people. You are like agents for the FBI and the CIA. <laughs> Mary, come here. Girl, don't this look like, this, this look like your tenant signature. You know the one that's over there in Unit 52? Voucher number 7563. You, you see how that L is shaped? That means y'all are doing a whole lot of work. You need, need to go to Aruba. Okay, let's move into a new regulatory provision. For those of you that are administering the single uh, room occupancy, which is the Section 8 My Rehab Program for homeless individuals. Now, of course, as you know, the intent behind the single room occupancy program is to get homeless individuals off of the street. Now, typically, homeless individuals have various, uh, you know, personal, uh, psychological, sociological issues that are going on that may prohibit them from being able to readily disclose their social security number. Now, of course, it is our business to house people, so we don't want to have this homeless individual continue to be homeless because they don't have the documentation. Most homeless individuals are working with multiple uh, state, local, and federal entities that are working with them to get their documentation in order. So the caveat for the single room occupancy is, is that that homeless individual does not have the Social Security card at the time of admission. You're going to admit them into the program, and you're going to let that individual know that they have 90 days to disclose the Social Security number. And again, there is a caveat. Um, they can be granted an additional 90 days uh, for disclosing that Social Security number. Now, you have to let Johnny know, unfortunately, that if at the conclusion of that six-month period, if the documentation has not been provided, you'll have to comply with 24 CFR Part 5, Section 218. Now, don't say that to Johnny. because. One of the things I, you know, I started the housing authority when I was fresh out of college, and so I was really textbook, and so I was doing my re-examination, and I said, well, you know, Ms. Smith, in accordance with 24 CFR Part 5, Section 218, you have the responsibility to disclose. The person is just like looking at me like, what on earth is she saying? And so I couldn't quite get it until, you know, Chris, Chris was training me. I remember I told you about Chris, who I sat next to for two weeks. And he said, you know, Nicole, do you ever watch Sanford and Son? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you know the, uh, the, the two police officers, Hoppy and Smitty? He's like, well, you were talking like uh, uh, Hoppy. Because, you know, Hoppy would come and, you know, break it down. And Fred would be like, what did he say? And then Smitty said, look, he's breaking and entering. <laughs> so my friends, just break it down in plain layman's terms for folks. Don't use all the jargon. We don't want to confuse our, our family. So 
we have to let the homeless individuals know that they basically will have 90 days and another 90 days to disclose the information. And of course, all the local government entities are working together, so I, I don't foresee anyone be remaining homeless or being evicted from a program because of a social security number disclosure. So I just want to let you know that there is that latitude for that program. Okay, referrals to Social Security to the uh, Social Security Administration. I want everyone to understand the department's intent here. Remember, the purpose of this rule is to implement EIV to ensure that we're able to get income information about the families and individuals that we serve. In order for HUD to get that information and make it available to you, the PHA, we have to have a Social Security number. Now, logistically, Every individual who is a U.S. citizen, and I shouldn't say every, it's most, if not all, individuals who are a U.S. citizen or national or who are lawfully present in the United States have been issued a Social Security number. And if you remember the little handout that I gave you on the September 24th training session, there's three types of Social Security cards. There's the one that is given to individuals who are U.S. citizens and U.S. nationals. Okay, there's a second card that's given to non-citizens who have refugee or asylee status. If you see a card, you know, for a refugee or asylee status, they have lawful permanent residency. The third card is the card issued to non-citizens who are present in the United States and they've been issued a Social Security card for some unrelated purpose. Okay, and those individuals do not have lawful permanent residency. Okay, you also have non-citizens who are here in this country legally. They're authorized to work here, but not live here on a permanent basis. So my friends, if you heard me earlier, the key of determining whether or not somebody is eligible to receive financial assistance is determining whether or not they have eligible immigration status. Eligible immigration status means they have permanent residency in the United States, which is evidenced by a green card, or other documentation that's, that's referenced on that Homeland Security uh, document, okay? So if they don't have permanent lawful residence, as long as there's another uh, eligible citizen or eligible non-citizen, then you would prorate the assistance. And I wanna make sure that I emphasize this because I, I, I'm still hearing in places such as Arizona and Texas and, and Massachusetts and areas that have high, um, uh, populations of non-citizens, housing authorities are denying financial assistance to individuals who really are eligible to receive assistance or you're denying as, uh, assistance to mixed families. That is an ultimate no-no. As long as you have one eligible individual, you can have five people in a household and if four of them are, are not here lawfully, as long as you have that one, you have to house them. Okay, you may not deny assistance. Section 214 of the Housing Act classifies them as a mixed family. Okay, so if you're unclear about that, you need to send an email message to pih.rip.ta at hud.gov because it's very disturbing for the Secretary of HUD. In fact, when I leave this, this session today, I have a meeting this very evening about the immigration issue. Okay, so we want to make sure that no family is being turned away unfairly, okay? Now remember, if it's a single, single person and they don't have eligible immigration status, you can't help them. If Mary comes and Mary is pregnant and she's not legit, you cannot assist her or do anything until that, if that child is going to be a U.S. citizen, you can't do anything until that baby is born. Can't admit Mary into the household, I mean into the program, because she's one person. On paper, she's one person and she's not eligible, so she cannot receive financial assistance. Once Mary has the baby and the baby is classified as a U.S. citizen, then you may admit her into the program. The assistance is going to be prorated. And remember, proration is very simple. One out of two families are eligible, so they get half the assistance. Okay, so I just want to make sure that I emphasize this. So for individuals who come in and say, hey, I don't have a social security number or I lost my card, 
Uh, you want to refer them to the Social Security Administration if they do not have any other documentation that was issued by a state or federal government agency. So you'll refer them to the local SSA to request an original or replacement Social Security uh, uh, card. Now I want to also share with you because a lot of times um, some of us are not quite familiar with the Social Security number processing and so it's okay because I have done all the research for you and um, you know I was once naive and so I didn't know any better. They said well you know Ms. Faison I went to my local SSA office and they told me it's going to take about two years for my, for my baby to get a Social Security <laughs> card and you know they ran out of the special paper to print the cards on so you know I'm like okay. Mm -mm. The average length of time for a newborn to be issued a Social Security number and a card is four weeks. That's the average. Now, if you go to your, um, and can, can uh, Shay or somebody, can you bring me the um, training material book up here? But uh, what I want you to do is you flip to, there's a tab in your training books that's labeled Social Security numbers. And I have a chart in there that outlines, yep, she's got it right there. There's a chart in there that outlines for every state the average number of weeks it takes for a new uh, social security, a newborn to receive a social security card. Okay. Now there's only one state that exceeds 12 weeks. Remember, 12 weeks is basically 90 days, that threshold in the regulation. That's Illinois. So if you're in, in Illinois and they say, look here, Ms. Faison, um, I still haven't got my Social Security card. You can look right at that chart and say, oh, yeah, Illinois, yeah. Um, they're the only one that's exceeding 12 weeks. I think it's like 14 weeks. How much? Is, yeah, 14 weeks. Okay, there's a couple other states that are like in double digits. But for the most part, every state is under that 12-week threshold or 90-day threshold. Now, penalties for failing to disclose and verify the Social Security numbers. Again, the regulations are the same, but tweaked a little bit. And basically, um, the exception or caveat to termination, and I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know any housing authority prior to this rule who has terminated somebody for not disclosing a Social Security number. I, I just don't. If somebody knows, let me know, because I've never come across one. But um, I know somebody in here has done it. Did I hear some snickering at the back room? You're like, yeah, girl, I did it. <laughs> we have a caveat in the regulation now that basically says, look, if a family can demonstrate unforeseen circumstances as, for, as to why they cannot comply with this requirement, the PHA may defer the termination for an additional 90 days. So in essence, if you're doing the math, if you're following this training session, 90, 90, 90. That's 270. So we're up to nine months because basically you could get to the point where you've been granted the two extensions under the first 5.216 and then get to the part where it's time to terminate. Okay, well, Mary, you know, I gave you the 90-day extension. I gave you the no another 90-day you didn't turn around and then Mary comes and says well you know just when I was getting ready to go to the Social Security Administration I was involved in an automobile accident and I was in the hospital for two weeks no she said for nine months <laughs> <laughs> but there, 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 there could be some extenuating circumstances and that's why I'm just saying that this rule facilitates basically a nine month uh, you know, window for compliance, okay? So basically, you could get to the point where you say, okay, Mary, here's your notice that we're going to terminate your assistance, but you could defer it for another 90 days if they came up with a logical, you know, reason that explained, you know, that there were some unforeseen circumstances as to why they didn't comply with the requirement, okay? Now, PIH Notice 2010. This is in your handout. Now, for those of you, there's only a couple of you that noticed that uh, PIH Notice 20-10-3 uh, was posted, uh, if I'm not mistaken, last week 
and then it disappeared. The reason it disappeared is we're making a small minor change to the purpose paragraph, and it should actually be posted. Should be posted if, because um, what happened is that the administrative uh, corrections to the uh, regulations was inadvertently omitted. It has no impact on the rule, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, that notice should be reposted today. If not, uh, it should be reposted today or tomorrow. But 2010-3, and if you have uh, your book here, there should be a tab called HUD Guidance Social Security Numbers. And here is the notice that was issued on January 20th. Remember I said earlier as you're preparing to implement the requirements of this rule, you need to make sure that any of your occupancy staff that are tasked with doing annual re-exams, interim re-exams, read this notice so that they understand the uh, requirements for the Social Security number. And you'll notice that we have screenshots showing you what it looks like when EIV is confirming that the identity has been verified, the Social Security number is valid. Now, let's get into the new regulation. And it's a very short and sweet regulation, 24 CFR Part 5, Section 233, which is the mandated use of the EIV system. This is a new regulatory provision that requires PHAs to use EIV as a third party source to verify employment and income information during all interim and um, uh, annual re-exams. Now, of course, the caveat is in accordance with HUD guidance and 24 CFR Part 5, Section 236. Now, I know a lot of, a lot of folks have said, well, how on earth am I going to use EIV to verify tenant income when the quarterly wage data is six months old. And so, my friends, I'm going to explain to you how we're going to RAB, reduce administrative burden, using EIV system. Um, and we have a uh, PIH notice that's coming out. Do you, anybody remember 2004-1? Anybody remember that? Anybody remember the verification hierarchy? Okay, she remembered it, because she, she, she's like nine, like she, she know it vividly. She probably can tell me what color those um, grids were. So during the break, you come see me. I have a gift for you. Okay, so we're reintroducing the verification hierarchy, okay? And we also are defining or redefining some things that have never been defined before. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment in the next segment. So I'm, I'm getting you ready because I'm getting excited. Erica, do you have my medication? Because you know I get excited, so you know I take that little pill to you know bring me down a notch. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to streamline the income verification process using EIV and some documents that traditionally have been labeled as taboo, but they're no longer taboo. Okay. Secondly, you're going to be required to utilize the other functions of EIV to reduce administrative errors, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in just a moment as well. But remember, EIV initially was created to really address tenant underreporting of income. Now, of course, EIV wasn't created in a vacuum. We created this system with feedback from housing authorities all across the country. And so many of you, um, and one, one of my uh, you know, dear, dear, dear uh, colleague, uh, Glenn uh, Thice, and I forget where Glenn is from, but uh, I want to say this is 2010. And about four years ago, Glenn sent me an email about this notion of, you know, really would be great if PHAs had a national repository of information regarding tenants or former tenants that owe a debt to another housing authority. And so when I got Glenn's email way, way back then, I was like, man. He's got something there. And so what happened in September 2009, my friends? What did we roll out in EIV? The debts owed to PHAs, OK? So that didn't happen because HUD woke up one day and said, oh, we're going to do this. No, if you listened to our assistant secretary earlier, she talked about collaboration between HUD and the PHAs. This is not something uh, that you know, administering these programs can be done one-sided. You know, we're one 
one entity. We're, our ultimate goal is serving people. And so we want to make sure that if you have suggestions, if you have, uh, you know, uh, you know, recommendations for how things can be done better or tools that we can initiate and create that will make administering these programs a little bit easier, then we want to be able to do that. So I'm really, you know, delighted that we have had an opportunity over the last six years to make EIV bigger and better because all those functions in there outside of the income, that's all because of feedback from you all. And we've made that happen. So I, I want to, you know, say thank you to Glenn and, uh, you know, others. Uh, of course, uh, Anita stock it out at the New York City Housing Authority. I used to live in New York for a hot minute because, uh, you know, NYCHA is a very large housing authority and, you know, we want to try and put mechanisms in place that will help, uh, you know, RAB reduce administrative burdens for larger housing authorities. And so we do these things uh, in concert with housing authorities hearing what you're saying, letting us know what works, what doesn't work. And so uh, I, I think that, you know, going forward, uh, you're going to see some changes uh, you know, within HUD and within the way that we do business. And so I'm, I'm really proud to um, say that uh, in the Office of Public and Indian Housing, we, we have a very high, um, you know, high customer service sac satisfaction rating. And so that's because we're listening and we're, and we're helping one another. So I, I thank you for that. So let's get into uh, basically our question and answer session. And I know we are running a little behind uh, Rachel, because what I want to do is um, the next session or the next segment of this training is going to focus on effective use of EIV. So what I'd like to do is um, entertain questions based on the rule itself, you know, 24 CFR, Part 908, uh, Part 216, 218, and Part 233. If you have questions specifically about the requirements outlined in, in the rule. Um, if you have EIV system specific questions, if it doesn't pertain to the deceased tenants or the debts owed module, we're not going to entertain those questions today. We will entertain those offline because really this training is geared towards um, successful implementation of the rule. And so I do want to let you know that for those of you out there who are new housing authority staff individuals, uh, you will want to uh, review the webcast from February 11th and 12th of 2009. That is what we call initial EIV system training, which is a comprehensive training that allows for you to understand all the mechanisms in the system. So February 11th and 12th is comprehensive EIV system training. Um, uh, if you are uh, uh, let me see, if you're an existing EIV user, you want to make sure that you're going to tune into uh, this January 28th training session. And staff are expected to complete the training by April 29th, which is the next um, EIV user certification period. So we want to make sure that folks understand now that EIV is mandated, uh, we want to make sure that you understand how to effectively use the system. And so we're going to talk about effective use of the system um, in the next segment. So, Rachel, do we? Okay, I'm sorry, my earpiece is a little out. Okay. Yes. Okay, so we're going to take some questions that have um, come in, and, you know, with the mandated use of EIV, as promised by HUD, we are providing guidance. Uh, we do have a PIH notice that's uh, basically EIV implementation guidance notice. And again, I can't emphasize the importance of uh, subscribing to the PIH RIP mailing list because as information uh, is created for you to assist you, we're sending it out automatically to you. So you don't have to worry about trying to figure out when is something going to come out and when it comes out, where do I find it. So I want to make sure you subscribe to the mailing list. Um, so that you can automatically receive that information. So let me, let me go over here and see we have a question. Regarding the income discrepancy report, please explain actual and annualized annual discrepancy information. What we're going to do is we're going to talk offline um, to this question because this question really is not, this is an EIV system specific 
And we're going to be talking about, just a moment, um, the income discrepancy resolution process. So we'll, we'll come back to that question in the second segment. Regarding the immigration report, do we do anything with the eligible non-citizen? You don't do any, and one of the things, uh, you, if you watch the September 24th training, we talked about the immigration report. This report is just designed to help you identify individuals who you generated an alternate ID for, okay? So if you have somebody who's on the immigration report and they're classified as an eligible non-citizen, what do you need to do with that family? What do you need to do with them? Exactly. Come see me. I have a gift for you. What, what you have to do with these individuals, you have to say, hey, uh, you know, we generated this number for you because you didn't have your Social Security card at the time, so we need for you to disclose your Social Security number. So what you may want to do is you may want to run this immigration report uh, to see who your eligible, uh, oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute, do we, eligible non-citizens. I'm sorry, I misread that. I thought it was eligible citizen. But let me, let me back up. Your eligible citizens who show up on the immigration report, like you said, yes, you need to follow up with them to make sure that you get their Social Security number. Okay? With the eligible non-citizen, okay, if you have classified somebody as an eligible non-citizen, that means they have lawful permanent residency and they should have a Social Security number. So again, yes. You need to follow up with Mary and say, uh, Mary, I need your Social Security card. So either way, whether it's an eligible non-citizen or an eligible citizen that's showing up on your immigration report, that report is there to alert you to the fact that you need to get a Social Security number. Now, do keep in mind, if you have individuals on your immigration report and it says ineligible non-citizen, you know there's nothing to be done because the ineligible non-citizen, A, is not receiving financial assistance, so they're not expected to disclose a social because most likely they don't have one to disclose anyway. Now, I got a call just earlier this week, and they said, Nicole, I had a tenant that came in, reported that they were working, gave me pay stubs that had a Social Security number on there. They used that social and put it on the 5-8, and that Social Security number came back as not belonging to that individual. Right. Now, this is why I love you folks, because, see, we love our jobs. So she was like, well, Nicole, she's like, should I go on over there to the Homeland Security and, you know, <laughs> refer them over there? Because she committing fraud, because she using somebody else's Social Security number. We're, we're not the police, okay? <laughs> And then, you know, she's like, well, she done committed fraud because she done gave me this uh, pay stub. Now, I want you to be very careful with using that word fraud because fraud, the definition in accordance with HUD regulations is that the person has intentionally withheld information, okay? And in order for the person to be found to have committed fraud, that has to be established by a court of law. So that's why I always tell people, I said, you know, I know, because we get real excited. I mean, it's an adrenaline rush. I mean, the re reality is that, you know, I'm still working with Fox, Fox Network trying to get a reality TV for housing authorities because, I mean, you see some of this stuff that's going on. Now, if you remember, I told you when we first initiated EIV, the OIG was, was really rampant. They were down in Texas, and they were knocking on doors at 3 in the morning and arresting people. And it made the paper, and the former assistant secretary said, Nicole, I thought you said we weren't going to deploy EIV in Texas back then. I was like, well, you know, all, all is fair. I don't care if you're in Texas, California, Miami, or wherever. We need to know what people's income is. And so OIG, they're going in and busting doors just like cops. Right. You know, so I'm like, why can't housing authorities get, you know, why can't we get a reality TV show? Because I like to, you know. So I'm getting together a petition because we're going to get our own little network, right? So anyway, the bottom line is, is that report's going to help you to identify families and individuals that you need to follow up with, who you need a Social Security number for, the ones that are ineligible. Just make sure that you, and I know folks that are in the QA, Quality Assurance Division of your housing authorities, 
Use that report to make sure that your occupancy specialists are prorating the household uh, rent contributions, okay? That's a good way to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do because they may inadvertently, you know, on paper say one thing, but on the 5-8 say something differently. You want to make sure that when you have ineligible non-citizens that they are, in fact, uh, receiving prorated assistance. Okay, under PIH 2010, PHAs are required to obtain proof of SSN, such is the SSN card, then destroy the proof once EIV verifies the SSN. When the PHA is audited, how can the PHA prove they obtained the required proof of SSN if the proof has been destroyed? That's very easy, my friends. EIV. EIV is mandated. You're going to print out the EIV income report. The income report shows that they are verified. Once they're verified, you don't, there's really, technically, there's no need for you to have somebody's full Social Security number. Okay, again, like I said, we are making the recommendation that you destroy the Social Security number because we want to protect our families. Our families are vulnerable and susceptible to identity theft. A lot of your families are finding out for the first time. Poor, <laughs> poor Miss Sally. That woman is 85 years old and she shows up at the annual reexamination and you telling her that she works at Bingo World and she got a job over at Home Depot and she's like, what? You know, I don't work nowhere. I've been getting my Social Security and disability since 1942. Somebody has stolen her identity. Okay, so a lot of your families are going to find out for the first time that their identity has been stolen. We had a situation in North Carolina. A little chicken poultry farm was buying Social Security numbers. And they were bringing in, you know, the illegal workers across, you know, from wherever, and they have bought some Social Security numbers. But I want to let you all know, if you don't know about E-Verify, and if you're, you're a housing authority, you're an employer, you all should be using E-Verify to confirm that the people you're hiring are legit. Okay? E-Verify is a system uh, sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security and the Social Security Administration. And again, the intent is to make sure that the individuals that you are hiring are authorized to work in the United States, okay? So E-Verify, Google it, or go to Homeland Security, E-Verify. If you're, you are an employer, so you need to make sure that you're using that system, okay? But that don't have nothing to do with HUD business. This is a plug for Homeland Security and SSA. Get my little uh, sponsorship. If you have a question, uh, do me a favor and come to the mic so that we can hear you. If you're shy, you can ask, ask me during the break. But um, if you're in this room, uh, if you have a question, you can step to the mic. Or, um, Rachel, if it's possible to get a wireless mic, because you know it's kind of tight in here. And, and I know some people, they're like, girl, I ain't getting up here and be like, excuse me, excuse me. So they didn't get to the mic. So if we could get a wireless mic. Hey, Erica, would you mind? Uh, 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 we have a question in the one, two, three, third row. And if you could come up and uh, do that. And... Oh, here's my favorite question. We're having difficulty in foster care agencies providing SSN. How do we get them to cooperate? All right, now we got two scenarios, okay? First scenario with foster care uh, children. There are the children that are of no relation to your tenant, Peggy, okay? And you all have to establish your policies. Now, remember, just because Peggy shows up and decides she wants to be a foster care parent for children that don't even belong to her, not even related to her or anything, you are not authorized or required to say, oh, yeah, sure, Peggy, you can bring in these, these four other children. It's a different story if the children are related to Peggy, okay? Now, and I had this come in just yesterday, okay? Uh, one of our HUD offices said, hey, we have the um, housing authority trying to get from the foster care parent, your tenant, the Social Security number. I said, okay, well, it may be that with the state, the state does not allow for pertinent information of that child be given to the foster care parent. Okay, not a problem. You as a housing authority, you need to reach out to that foster care agency or state entity and say, look, in order for us to provide assistance, we need birth certificate, social security card. If you can't get that, remember what we said earlier, this is to determine eligibility. Now, granted, I know that the foster child, we don't count the foster care payment 
but there is a requirement for HUD to know who is in its properties and know what what. Okay, so you need to work with the foster care agency and let them know as a condition of adding that foster care child to that family composition. If the foster care parent is not, doesn't have that information, that state or local agency has the responsibility to provide you, the PHA, directly that information. Okay, so um, if you want to, you know, take a little video clip clip of this segment and, you know, run it into your local foster care office. As a HUD official, I'm letting the foster care agencies know that HUD needs to know the date of birth and the social security number and our PHAs need to verify that information as any other federal agency, okay? So uh, we had a question right, um, Erica, before I go to this one, if we could have, um, and it may be easier to just walk around on, on that side since she's on the end. Um, you mentioned that uh, HUD would like us to remove the Social Security cards from the files, from the tenant files. But when our auditors come in annually, we'd get a finding if the Social Security cards are not in that file. Which auditors? The auditors that, the fee auditor that we hire to do our annual. And you're going to tell your auditors that this is the recommendation from HUD. Again, not required. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. But if you do it, it is not a finding because HUD has blessed that, pr that protocol. Okay, thank you. So, you know, auditors, and same thing with our HUD OIG here. We keep them abreast of the changes that's going on, okay? And remember, typically, if it's in writing, which it is, your, your, your PIH notice says we strongly encourage you to do that. Now, of course, we can't strongly encourage you to do it, and then the auditors come behind and say, ah, no. Okay, so the folks need to understand that this is the criteria that HUD has established. You have the discretionary authority to dispose of it because, again, just go to the ftc.gov website. You will see that identity theft is rampant. And so we already know that the tenant file has so much information. If I was a crook, I could come into your housing authority, steal your files, and get you know MasterCard, Visa, Discover, American Express, and I could do one of those identity theft commercials because they would see, you know, this lady in a gorilla suit on the beach in Aruba, uh -uh. and it's me. <laughs> but my name is Bubba. Okay, what is recommend? What is the recommended period of time for PHAs to allow families on the wait list to provide disclosure? and documentation of SSM before units are offered to the next eligible family on the waiting list. And if you go to the notice, I, I made a point to specifically address this. It is the PHA's discretion as to how long they allow the family to remain on the waiting list. But let's just say hypothetically, today a voucher becomes available. And you say, you know what, Sally? The voucher is available. Do you have your Social Security number? She's like, mm-mm. You go to the next person on the list. You get skipped. When you get your social, when the next voucher becomes available, it's yours. But if we come back to you again and you don't have it, PDSSSS. All right. Um, so that same thing with public housing. Public housing. You come to the top of the list. You don't have the Social Security documentation, you get skipped. Now you may, and again, a part of impl implementing this rule, you, the housing authority, need to sit down, and you all know the demographics of your communities better than HUD or anybody else, so you need to sit down and figure out, you know, how long are you going to allow somebody to sit on the waiting list? Is it going to be 90 days? Is it going to be 180? Is it going to be, you know, 120? You need to establish that criteria. HUD's not going to prescribe that because that you know best. Okay, we had a question. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, she can get to the mic. She don't have to go. Excuse me. Hi, would the head of household have the um, right to remove someone from their household? 
who refuse to um, supply a social security number, or would they have to be terminated? Oh, see, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, come back here, let me make sure I got it right. Because see, when you start asking the question, you know my mind start running a thousand uh, miles because I'm thinking of the scam. But anyway, okay, so the head of household has like adult household member, you know, you know, little, little boy Johnny that's 19, and the social security number hasn't been disclosed. And he don't want to go to social security. <laughs> and he don't want to go to social security. Okay, so here's the deal. All household members, head of household, including the household members, are required to disclose the SSN. If they do not disclose, do not have a reasonable explanation, reason beyond unforeseen circumstances, you need to let your head of household know that she is jeopardizing her assistance because if Johnny Boy does not disclose, then you're going to terminate the assistance. And you housing authority is going to have to make a decision here because I already know what's going to happen. Uh -uh, I don't want them to know I work down there at the Pet Boys, so we're just going to take you off the lease, but he's still going to be up there in the unit or on the voucher and but see then you, you open up a whole nother can of worms so you have to be strategic in your in your policy setting and plans because realistically at our housing authority you couldn't just come in and take that grown child off the lease unless I saw a telephone bill a lease uh, something showing that you got a, you got a car registered at some other address in that subsidized unit Okay, but again, you have to make those determinations as to how it's going to be, but you need to let them know if your household members do not disclose, everybody's got to go. And it's not like, oh, okay, well, you know, go on and go. The whole family's gone. So for an applicant family, let's say there's one member of the household that refused, can they just remove them from the application? Mo and, and again, Before they get pulled from the wait list? There's, 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 there's really, there's, there's not a HUD regulation that says they can do that. But you hear, you hear your PHA family here, it seems like what the standard policy is, and again, it's, it's just, just a discretionary policy for the housing authority to decide how you're going to deal with those scenarios. Again, you all know the demographics of your communities, and you face you know, routine occurrences of situations, and you know what's okie doke and what's not, okay? And at the end of the day, I mean, just, just, just think about it like this. If a family's coming to you and they want assistance, but yet they're refusing to comply with the requirement, most likely there's something that's being hidden. So do you really want to admit them in a program anyway? No. Because the likelihood is that something is something's going to go a wire and again you don't you have to look at each situation on a case by case situation i mean regulatory and statutorily i can't tell you to do one thing or the other it's, it's a local it's a local decision we had a question um, if you could come 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 to the mic oh i answered it already yes yes but I, I already know, this is the majority, majority of y'all here together, so they're like, uh-uh. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm having di difficulties. I'm sorry, Rachel. What'd you say, Rachel? Uh, yeah, let's check the next email. If immigrants' visa documents have expired, do they need to get them updated before submitting them as part of the recertification process? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I'm going to skip this question, but I, I want to let you know that a visa is just a document that they're here legitimately. They don't have lawful permanent residency, so it's, it's kind of irrelevant. But we'll talk about that offline. I know I didn't see nothing about some, I, I was getting scared. I thought I saw something about a compressed work schedule. <laughs> um, what if you want to add non-contending household members? They won't have an SSN. Can they be added with an alternate ID? Yes. I know you were like, what? Remember what I said, your, your folks, 
who do not contend to have eligible immigration status, as long as you have another legit person in the unit, you're not providing financial assistance, okay? So for anybody who's on the family composition, if they don't have a social, and, and this is the one that's not contending to have eligible immigration status, you're gonna go into pick and use that alt ID and you're gonna generate the alternate ID. So let's go to the second part. The rule says documentation can be from a federal state government agency, but the notice says federal, state, or local government agency. Is local still acceptable? Local, local governments is acceptable. Because I do realize that uh, in some states, you have, like, for example, uh, department, uh, your state Department of Health uh, and Human Resources, which administers the um, TANF program and your, and your foster care programs. But underneath of them is, a, say, like a local like county agency that administers those programs. And so those are acceptable um, documentation. And one of the things I want to point out is that the way the regulation was written is that um, HUD can prescribe additional documentation that we deem acceptable. Okay, so the bottom line is the Social Security number is really going to be very easy because either you have one or you don't, and if the number you disclose either is valid or invalid, there is no in-between. So your families also need to understand that if they disclose a Social Security number and it comes back invalid, and it's not invalid because you made a boo-boo on the 5-8, there could be some problems, okay? And that problem is that you're jeopardizing your assistance. And so anytime, you know, there's a problem with a discrepancy in a Social Security number, that family should be referred to the Social Security Administration. And, you know, if there's a discrepancy, the best case scenario is to just use the Social Security card. And remember, uh, if I'm not mistaken, September 24th training, one of the handouts that I uh, gave you was a summary of all the changes that have been made to the Social Security card since its issuance in the early 1930s. So you can see the criteria of a valid Social Security card and SSA, of course, is continuously, as well as every federal agency, trying to make sure that uh, the documents that they're producing are, cannot be forged. Now, of course, we have some really technically savvy people, and so you know, I could go down there to the corner deli and go to the back and you know, Bob sells me a Social Security card, birth certificate, and a driver's license for $775, and that's what you're going to get. But your families need to know that their identity is validated against the Social Security Administration. So when we run that name, the date of birth, and the social, if it doesn't match SSA database, then uh, it's going to come back invalid. And if you also look at that PIH notice, there's a chart towards the back that explains all the error messages you could get and recommended corrective action that you can implement to get that verified, I mean that failed to a verified. Okay, when a PHA rejects documentation of an SSN, what is a reasonable amount of time to request that an individual obtain and submit acceptable documentation? And that's good, everybody here is saying 90 days, and that sounds reasonable, okay? Uh, so, you know, for Mary that came in with the photocopy of this, the SSN, okay, again, you need, she needs to know that she's going to have to get the information, but you want to prescribe in your policy what that time frame is going to be. HUD does not prescribe. You may want to just make it simple on yourself and use the guidelines for the SSN uh, for individuals, you know, under six and say make it 90. It's cleaner that way. That, again, that's going to be your discretion. So um, we're five minutes to three, and what I want to do is um, for our live studio audience uh, and for the folks viewing, we're going to go ahead and take a 15-minute break, and uh, we're going to come back at uh, about uh, quarter, quarter after three, and then we're going to move on. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a break. The bathrooms are out to your left. Uh, Shay, if you could take off the cover, there's light refreshments, soda, water, and juice, and uh, fruit snacks for you.